Welcome everybody. Our topic tonight for Ophthalmology Education Consultants Sunday evening webinar series is metabolic diseases to optometrists, a new twist on an old problem. My name is Dr. Joe Salka. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, our speakers tonight. Two speakers, one is Dr. Greg Caldwell, a 1995 graduate of Pennsylvania College of Optometry, where he also did a one-year residency in primary care and ocular disease at the, uh, at the IMCP. He is a diplomat, diplomat of the American Board of Optometry and a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and fellow of the Optometric Glaucoma Society. He is a ocular disease consultant in private practice in Duncansville and Johnstown, Pennsylvania. He has lectured extensively throughout the country and, and internationally. In 2010, he served as president of the Pennsylvania Optometric Association and served on the AOA Board of Trustees for 2012, 2013 through 2016. He is currently president of the Blair Clearfield Association for the Blind. Joining him and rounding out our discussion tonight is Dr. Tracy Opperbaum who is a PharmD. She got her degrees at Temple University. She also did a residency at Temple University Hospital where much of her time was spent in internal medicine and infectious diseases. She's currently on faculty at Salish University Department of Optometry, where she is a course director and instructor for all systemic pharmacology courses for students in the optometry, audiology, and physician assistant program. And she's a practicing clinical pharmacist uh, in Rosemont, VA. And very notable, she's also a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry. So with that, let's give a virtual welcome to Greg and Tracy. We're going to speak on metabolic disease for the optometrist, new twists on an old problem. So guys, take it away. Joe, thanks. And uh, it's truly an honor and a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you. Thanks everyone tonight for taking a little time on a Sunday. And again, I'd like to echo, Joe, what you highlighted there is, uh, you know, Dr. Offerdahl was a pharmacist, but it's really awesome that she's here as a fellow of the Academy. What do you call Tracy? Something opto, something pharmacentric? What do you oh, call I, that? I coined myself an optometricentric pharmacist. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> and it's been great working with Tracy over the last few years. Um, in, in lecturing together. It's really been a pleasure. So my disclosures here, the content of this activity was prepared independently by me and Tracy here, um, uh, by us. Uh, this really has no outside influence. You can see I've lectured from Alcon down to OptiView, advisory boards from Allergan to Dompe. I do sit as the PA medical director as the credentialing committee and uh, the special unit investigations for involved. It's a managed Medicaid it is a paid position, um, so I do like to disclose that. I do sit as the chairman of the advisory council for the diabetes registry for the healthcare registries. I have no financial or direct proprietary interest in any of the companies or products that I mentioned tonight. And probably the most important statement is this one right here towards the end is that the content and format of this course is presented without commercial bias, bias and does not claim any superiority or of any commercial products or services. And I am a half owner with uh, Dr. Saka with Optometric Education Consultants. We do webinars. We just launched our uh, uh, Enduring CE and uh, obviously we're doing uh, webinars. So with that being said, Tracy. Nothing to disclose, uh, no outside influence or commercial interests uh, in any of the products that we'll mention. Yeah. Get to that next slide. Let's see there, there we there go. There we go. That's Tracy's disclosures. Yep. And we'll jump into the webinar. There's the learning objectives. Uh, basically, I do two handouts when we do our webinars. Um, I do six slides per page plus the full slides uh, if you guys want to download them since they're PDFs. Um, but the learning objectives are in that. So right off the bat, we're going to do the first polling question. And the first polling question is as soon as I can move this so I can get to it. Have you seen or heard of a patient when he or she is, says that she's not diabetic, not hypertensive, but yet, you know, they come in and you or the technician has seen that they're taking metformin or lisinopril. So have you seen these patients that come in and they claim, hey, I'm, I'm not diabetic, I'm not hypertensive, 
and you're going to see tonight. And I, you know, I see that a lot of people are replying here. I'll share those results here shortly. That a lot of us has seen this, and there seems to be some confusion out there uh, in the world of how this can happen. And we want to chat about that here tonight. So that's part of the. So I'm just going to end the poll. I'll share the results, and uh, you can see here that you know majority, 94% of uh, the attendees here tonight have seen a patient like this. Um, a few of them have not, and one has, is is not sure. And that is a reason why we can be here tonight, right? So metabolic diseases falls into pre-diabetes. And you can see I have the ICD-10 code here, R73.03. Metabolic syndrome, which is E88.81. Diabetes has a whole list of E10 codes. E10 is if you know they're type 1 or insulin dependent. And then we have the E11 codes. And then rounding out the metabolic diseases are dyslipidemia and hypertension. So, you know, on ODs on Facebook, this is actually a Pennsylvania doc friend of mine, Kim. Uh, she, re she posts, you know, why do patients who are taking medications for diabetes insist that they are borderline? And then Troy Raber, an optometrist, and he was the executive director for many years down in uh, Delaware. Um, you know, he replies, I was annoyed until I got better understanding when I spoke to a group of primary care docs about diabetic eye care. Couldn't understand why every diabetic didn't have their blood sugar or A1C checked. So there's a lot of confusion out there, you know, how, you know, patients can be on medications like metformin, like lisinopril, but yet hey, I'm not diabetic, so quit calling me that, or, you know, I'm not hypertensive. And it comes back to the metabolic syndromes that are out there, which we'll talk about. And you can see over here, even, you know, Brenda replies down here, you know, R73.03 is, you know, maybe they're pre-diabetic. And that's the whole idea of electronic health records. Electronic health records are supposed to help us with that. You know, we're supposed to be able to get some, what's called a CCDA from, you know, the primary care doc, which then comes in and then you're able to consume using the electronic health record and, the, and all that uh, lingo that's out there, be able to consume it and import it rather than we as optometrists saying, well, you know, maybe you are diabetic or maybe you are this or maybe you are that. And then all of a sudden you start getting a bunch of ICD-10 codes, which are not, are not matching. You know, so here's something else. And, and, and Alan Glazer is a good friend of ours. You know, he's the founder of ODs on Facebook and He's asked Tracy, Joe, and I multiple times, you know, hey, hop on there, you know, please reply, please give some credibility. You guys, you know, are kind of leaders or experts or whatever the kind words that he gave us and asked us to give some validity. So, you know, here's just some other cuts that says, so I hate the diagnosis of prediabetes because patients generally get really confused. But besides that, I still provide the same care as far as diabetic exams go with letters to PCP. And that's all true. You know, and it does create confusion. It creates confusion maybe to the patient. Maybe this is not as serious as it could be. And you can see here, a lot of these people are on metformin. And that's why Tracy's on here tonight. She's going to kind of teach us like the, the magic behind metformin, all the kind of the positives, you know, and I really didn't know that until Tracy and I started hanging out, you know, the patient, here's, a, here's another comment. The patient is on metformin or another diabetic drug. Then they're diabetic, exclamation point. If, if they are not on any medication, then they're not. It's that simple. Well, you know, I don't think it's that simple. That's out there. You know, patients can be, uh, you know, pre-diabetic uh, or metabolic syndrome. And maybe we're trying to prevent this from happening. That's out there. And then we have Rick here that says about seven or eight percent of pre-diabetics have retinopathy. I treat them as the same as far as letters and billing, and that's true because we have some really cool technology out there. You know, we there's a saying out there. I didn't coin it. I'm not sure who coined it. Whenever, but I like repeating it. We always say that the crime must fit the punishment. So when it comes to looking at diabetes, and we use an OCT down at the bottom here, or traditionally. This is what I call a B-scan OCT, but we all know that diabetes, pre-diabetes, they're capillary diseases. 
So why are we looking at structure when we should be looking at the capillaries as we can see in these first two pictures here, this superficial cap, uh, capillary plexus or the deep capillary plexus. And then we can move through and get to the outer retina and choriocapillaris. And again, I use this a lot for my macular degeneration patients because they do turn, can turn wet. So when we're, again, the crime fitting the punishment, uh, we should be looking at uh, maybe the vascular, the capillaries, right? Diabetes is a capillary disease. That's why it affects our eyes, our fingers, our toes, our kidneys, you know, the neuropathies, the nephropathies, the retinopathies that are out there. So polling question number two is, Joe, can you launch that for me? And I'll sure. read this here. And it says, you know, this patient was diagnosed with diabetes in 2008 using metformin. His hemoglobin A1C is 7.6. You know, does he have diabetic retinopathy? And here is the picture right here uh, that we're showing. And, you know, clinical exam, you know, showing that, you know, I don't, you know, you know, using a 78 or, or, or 90 dilated, using 20 diopter examining. And, you know, here is a fundus photo. You know, does this patient have you know, diabetic retinopathy. And what I'm gonna chat about here is, is, you know, we went to school, at least I went to school probably 25, 30 years ago now, 1995 is when I graduated. And we learned the, what I like to call uh, the, in, in lectures and in talking to, to colleagues, the, the macro findings of diabetic retinopathy. I think we all can sit there and spout them all off, cotton wool spots and dot and blot hemorrhages you know, Irma, microaneurysms, so on and so forth. And, you know, I really don't see any of that in this, in this picture. So let's see how the poll's going here. I'm just going to end the poll. Joe, thank you for launching that. And I'm going to share the results. And you can see, you know, you, you have someone that says, you know, yes, maybe they see something on here that looks a little bit no, based on the picture, I agree. And the majority says, you know, further, you know, testing uh, is needed. And I totally agree with that, is that, you know, further testing is needed because, you know, back in the day when we were treating glaucoma, when I went to school and learned how to treat glaucoma, we didn't have GDX, we didn't have neurofiber layer analysis. And we based it off, you know, the neuroretinal rim and the notching and, you know, using the neurofiber layer, red free photos and um, non GDX and came along with nerve fiber layer. And now, now we have ganglion cell complex and nerve fiber layer to look at. And we can catch, you know, maybe glaucoma in an earlier stage by looking at ganglion cell complex. And using technology as like the foveal avascular zone, it's one of my favorite places to look. Because if you think about the foveal avascular zone in this center right here, you can see that there's no blood vessels, it's avascular. So I kind of think of it as being at the ocean, right? I'm standing on the sand, the water is washing up, and every, you know, and then the as the wave comes, then there's there's no water, but it's really thin there at the ocean. And as I walk into the ocean, it keeps getting deeper and deeper. And if I keep going out, then it's hundreds and thousands of feet deep. So I kind of think of this area going from avascular to to vascular where the capillaries is, this is one of the thinnest areas. So this is one of the most vulnerable areas where capillaries can be damaged from diabetic retinopathy. And this is that picture that I just showed you. And then this is the picture right beside it of someone with early changes to their vasculature, right? Right up here, you can see that this is a microaneurysm. You can see the capillary dropout that's falling out. And then over here is just kind of showing you <coughs> just kind of a, a normal foveal avascular zone. And I like this picture here, um, looking at 2015. And again, it, when you're interpreting an OCT, it's diabetes occurs in this inner retina because that's where the superficial and deep plexus are. Between the inner and outer retina, there's a loose separation or just, just a loose adhesion there 
So that's why a lot of the times if we jump down here to 2017, between this inner and outer retina, this is where we want to start looking for diabetic retinopathy because there's just an area, potential space in there where exudate and hemorrhage can accumulate. But what I'm looking at here is this vessel density map. The blue lakes are, are normal, but you can see the blue lakes are definitely increasing as time goes by and the capillary damage is occurring. But if you look here in 2015, you're really not seeing any diabetic retinopathy. Maybe this is a hemorrhage or an exudate because you can see it's hyperfluorescing and it's thick enough to create this, this, this hypo column because it's blocking it, whatever blood or exudate. You'd have to look with your 78 to see what color it is. Uh, you can't really differentiate on an OCT if it's exudate or a hemorrhage, but that's what that is. And you have something here. So you're starting to get leaky capillaries, but look at how much damage there is before you start seeing it on the traditional B scan. So I'm just going to show you a couple, you know, a couple cases here and how I use, you know, technology. And then we'll jump into some of the pre-diabetes and the metabolic and let Tracy kind of teach a little bit of some of the magic here that's out there. But I'm going to pause and just say, Trace, I know you, I've been doing a lot of the talking. Is there anything that you, that you need to or want to say before I jump in and go any further? No, so I've been paying attention to the chat and talking there a little bit, but okay, proceed perfect. onward. All right. So Angio Wellness Report, you know, there's lots of OCTs out there. I use an OptiView. And again, you use what's comfortable in your practice. I like the OptiView because it actually measures and can give me capillary density. But what I want to point out here, this is what something looks like normal. You can see a normal B scan. It's giving you GCC and the retinal thickness map. And then down here, I like the foveal avascular zone. And I can see that this one here is 0 0.19 and 0 0.21 with a 0 0.02 difference. And I, I teach OCT interpretation and I don't really start scratching my head until this foveal avascular zone starts to get to be about a 0 0.1 difference. Those foveal avascular zones should be normal. And people ask me what the normal size is. As you can see here, this one's like kind of 0.2, but I've seen them 0.4, you know, and structure and anatomy is different. The key is symmetry when you're looking at OCT. So this is just a normal, healthy, you know, OCT. So here's the patient diabetes number one. And you can see here why I like looking at the vascular pattern, because if you come up here and you look at the B scan on the right eye, if you look where we like to look between that inner and outer retina, as I scan across this patient here, I am really not seeing any in the traditional B scan in the right eye or the left eye. I'm not really seeing any changes. I can dilate this patient, look for those cotton wool spots, dot and blot hemorrhages, Irma, venous beating, all those macro changes that we were taught. But when I jump down here to the foveovascular zone, I see a 0 0.35 and a 0 0.20. And it's usually the one that's enlarge, usually the larger. And you can see here, it kind of breaks that rule that it's not within that symmetry of 0 0.1. So when we look over here at the foveal avascular zone, and then I have it magnified over here, you can see that right around that area, again, remember it's avascular in the center. So one of the earliest susceptible areas is right where it starts to become uh, capillaries. Oops, hold on, getting sloppy with my slides here. Hold on. As you can see right here, that's actually, there's some dropout. And even if you go out a little bit further into the macula area, you can see that there's dropout and microaneurysm formation. And this patient we would claim as no diabetic retinopathy based upon our traditional type of exam. And, but yet they have diabetic retinopathy changes. So let me ask poll number three here, Joe, if you can do number three. Would you code this patient as diabetic retinopathy? You know, on an exam, you would see no hemorrhages, no dot and blots, no exudates. You know, the only thing we're using here is specialized testing looking at the capillaries. Would you classify this patient as diabetic retinopathy? Tracy, you mentioned monitoring the chat. Anything in there of interest? 
first just some talk about, um, you know, starting at the beginning when you were talking about the ODs on Facebook and, um, you know, how can somebody be on metformin and not have diabetes? So a couple of people said, you know, it's used in women for polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is very true. And a lot of people think PCOS is kind of like a female metabolic syndrome early. Um, yeah, so it was some, some good chatter. Good. All right. So how are we doing with the poll? Let's see. We got 61%. Do you code this as diabetic retinopathy? Going to give it another few seconds here for people to, to weigh in. I'm going to end the poll and share the results. And you can see it's kind of mixed. And the uh, majority says bill it as uh, by a majority of, I guess, four, you know, uh, say the head bill as retinopathy. One of the other hats I wear is I'm the third party chair for, for Pennsylvania. And I've been working with medical payers and billers for, for many years and actually set up a few fun diabetic patients with diabetes programs where we actually work with the insurance company and use patients that are within the POA and they join what's called the Pennsylvania Diabetic Alliance, which is, this says that they're going to bill medically and communicate and do all this stuff. It doesn't cost any more. And then we work with the, with the payers to get these patients back that haven't been in with that are in, in, outside of what their quality period is. So I have this close relationship. So I asked them, I said, hey, I have these patients and, you know, it doesn't really that dot and blot hemorrhage. You're not really seeing it on the exam. And they said, absolutely, it's diabetic retinopathy. It's your, your technology is outside. You got capillary damage. You got dropout. It is diabetic retinopathy. You say so you can bill it accordingly uh, as diabetic retinopathy. So I think I'm not sure if the results were shared and unshared. I wasn't watching. So I'll just share them real quick and then stop sharing them. So yeah, here's another patient again coming in that is a patient with diabetes and someone that I would, um, you know, probably classify as being pretty clear. If you look right here in this right eye, if you learn to look between this inner and outer retina, this little speck is probably one of the earliest signs. And this little speck right here, over here, way over to the to the right or onto the left of the picture, but in the right eye. Um, way over here, kind of temporally, you can see a couple little specks. That's probably some exudate, some leakage, but you can see there's no retinal edema. But when we jump down to the foveal vascular zone, you can see that's right at that mark where I'm talking about asymmetry. And the larger eye is usually the one that's expanding. But if you look at the right eye, you can see there's some dropout in that area of the foveal vascular zone. It's kind of losing its roundness, if that's a word. And if you come over to the, to the left eye, you definitely can start to see some of this dropout and how it's expanding. And maybe you can see some of the capillary changes that are occurring. So this is a patient that we definitely would want to, uh, you know, make sure we know what their hemoglobin A1C is. Let them know that, you know, if they're having capillary changes in their eye, you can kind of make that loose assumption that, you know, there's probably changes going on in the brain and in the heart and in the kidneys and in the fingers and in the toes uh, with this condition. And then if you jump down here, you know, you just don't always can rely on the foveovascular zone measurement. You got to interpret these. These look pretty good. But if you jump up into the to the B scan, you can see some edema that's going on. And then when you look at the patient a little bit closer with this on FOSS tab, you can definitely see that there's exudate and bleeding. You can see again, here's that inner retina and outer retina right in here as you can see some of the, the bleeding, you can see some of the capillary changes that are occurring. This is definitely diabetic retinopathy that we're picking up on with this patient. Hey, Greg, if you had no OCT, this is the chat room, would you have still coded it uh, diabetic retinopathy? Um, well, I'd have to have some type of clinical finding to be able to classify it. So if I was, if I was practicing without this technology and there's other technologies out there, Dr. Nate Lighthizer does this, um, electrodiagnostic, this flash flicker, uh, 
uh, electrodiagnostic that is able to pick up without some type of clinical finding, I would just say it's no diabetic retinopathy. What I don't like about that is it's giving the patient maybe a false sense of, all right, I'm sitting at maybe a higher hemoglobin A1C and uh, it's allowing them to go maybe another year before getting those macro changes where we can pick it up. So um, unless I have a clinical finding, long drawn out answer, I wouldn't bill it as, I would just say, hey, E11.9, no diabetic retinopathy. So here is a 58 year old man with diabetes, new patient to the practice, you know, blood sugar he's unsure of. Last hemoglobin A1C, eh, I'm not really sure. I'm 58, I'm taking metformin, glyburide, uh, invocana. Trace, what's, what's invocana? What type of medication? I know it's diabetes, but what's that uh, in all your kind of classification? What type of medication is that? And you're muted, Trace. I learned to read lips. So I know what you said, but you might want to let the audience know. <laughs> It's one of the newer SGLT2 inhibitors. So when we get to that, remember that uh, it's one of these new medications that Tracy's going to talk about here. So vision's 2020, anterior segment's normal. You know, here's his posterior segment. And this goes kind of goes, Joe, back to the question that you just asked me. You know, if I did a dilated exam, took these photos, looked closely, there's no way that I would classify this as diabetic retinopathy. And, and you know, I'd probably say E11.9, you know, diabetes without any, without any retinopathy. The B scan looks really, really good. You know, you can tell he's a little bit older, he's starting to get a little bit of, you know, vitre adhesion right here, vitreous adhesion. It's not vitreous macular traction. Um, everything looks good. But when we jump down here, you know, 0.1524, okay, it's not that 0.1, but we're getting darn close. So when we take, start taking a closer look at this gentleman and we start looking at his folio avascular zone, his right eye looks pretty good. And maybe a little bit of thinning in this area, but you're starting to see some of the vascular changes that are occurring. And this is where we really, really, you know, early diagnosis uh, for this patient. So we definitely want to time to get to know this patient, 58, you know, I said, look, we need to find out at least what your hemoglobin A1C is. We need to talk to your PCP because we know for sure that you're going to end up with some more, you know, with some definitely some macro changes and why wouldn't we want to intervene, you know, at this point. 61 year old man with diabetes, blood sugar is 134. And hemoglobin A1C 8.0, he's using Novolog and Amaryl and 2020 vision. And again, looks pretty good on these, on these photos, maybe some torturosity, but that could just be from being a hyperope. But when we start looking at the vascular, and this is really cool, you know, this is called on, um, I'm sorry, a montage where it's able to kind of take the optic nerve and the, and the, uh, macula and kind of sew them together to see what's going on uh, with this patient. And I think you can see more in this left eye of the microaneurysm, the capillary dropout uh, that's occurring uh, with this patient. Again, the crime must fit the punishment. You know, diabetes is a capillary disease. We want to look at the capillaries. So then when we get a little bit better look and you can see some more vitreomacular adhesion, uh, you can tell the patient is 64, that vitreous is pulling away. And as we start, that was the uh, right eye. This is the left eye. Getting a little closer look, we can see on the onfos, you're starting to pick up some of the uh, exudate or hemorrhaging that's occurring. You can see the vascular changes that's going on with this patient. And we definitely want to try and get them a little bit better controlled. Now, when you come over to the left eye, look at this foveal vascular zone. Look how it's expanding, dropping out. And, you know, the macula, the foveola is pretty important to, to vision, right? So this is why we want to try to, next thing we're going to have is edema and you where know, we have damage, oxidative stress, all those things that we can helping along with the sugar, you know, there's now some nutritional things that, that we can discuss at some point, but look at these two eyes side by side, you know, this eye is definitely worse, microaneurysm formation. Uh, then, you know, it just hasn't got to the point where it's the, the body, the, the retina is able to keep up with the leaky capillaries. Eventually there'll be too many, the retina will swell, then you'll start getting dot hemorrhages, blood hemorrhages, 
and all the macro changes that occur that we were taught with diabetes. So, so the OCT and OCTA certainly are beneficial and essential um, while when evaluating a patient. So Greg, there was one question asking um, the name of the OCT retina camera that you were using. Yeah, um, the, the images that I'm using is an OptiMap and then the OCT that I'm using here is OptiView uh, OCT angiography. And again, there's other instruments out there that can do angiography, but they're not a combination. These are two separate instruments and there are some combos that are out there. Um, but one of my pearls, if you're going to look for an OCT that does angiography, look for one that measures because you can see the value of those. Um, there's only one that's out there, but we need to be fair and balanced. This is CE that's out there, but I just give you the questions to, to ask your OCT providers. Hey, Greg, somebody in the chat oh. asked, what's the hyperreflective area on the ultrasound portion right in the throat of your region due to? Say that again, Jay, you faded right at the very end. What is the hyperreflective area on the ultrasound portion right in the fovea region due to? Uh, we're, let's go back. So it's, uh, I, I see the question. It says, what is the hyperreflective area on the ultrasound portion right in the foveal region due to the hyper? So I'm not sure what the, the person is asking. Can you help me, Joe, with, uh, what, it, what it, is it? Go back one slide. It, it looks like right in the middle, there is a hyperreflective, uh, right uh, here. Yeah. Down here. Yes. Yeah, I think it's just where all the light kind of gets confocally. Uh, there's really nothing there. We see that kind of a bit. Um, and it's just kind of a mirror effect with that. There's really nothing there. It's just the way the light gets, uh, the coherent light just uh, uh, just hits that area and just hyper reflects. So that's a great question. Yeah, we do see this, this quite a bit. If this is what we're asking, there's nothing pathological with that. It's just the light comes in and then it kind of gets bounced into the center there and it just kind of hyper reflects uh, out of there. So, and then you get some internal reflection also. So between the internal reflection and the kind of that mirror effect, that's why you get that hyper reflection. Good question. And then a lot of people will ask if this is uh, macular edema and it's not, um, remember that the fovea or the foveola is made up of cones and the cones are tall and skinny and the rods are short and fat. So when you see this little, we used to see this every so often on time domain on a really, really good scan. If you remember Stratus by Zeiss, that was kind of the first time domain. Then all these companies came out with spectral domain. Time domain that did about 50,000 scans. Uh, I'm sorry, about 15,000 scans per second. And then the new spectral domain came out and did 30,000 scans. In order to get angiography, you're up to about 70,000 scans per second. And then what happens with that is you're able to subtract out what's moving versus not moving, and then you can get the vascular pattern. So when you're scanning at 70,000 scans per second, you can get some really cool stuff that, that, that you can see. And that's what that is because there's so many scans going on. Good question. All right. And so... Here's ODs on Facebook. You know, what, di not, what diagnostic code do you use for a patient who's pre-diabetic, right? So now we're getting in. So there's a lot of confusion out there, right? So my point is in using ODs on Facebook and Alan Glazer's, you know, he's got, you know, 45 or 50,000 people. I like hopping on there because it just helps me to, and Joe and I and Tracy to pick, all right, let's go and chat about this. And so you can see, you know, the patient isn't pre-diabetic or he or she is on metformin. Right, right, Jay. So here's a lot of confusion out there. How can they be, you know, on metformin and, you know, pre diabetic? Um, so, you know, that's why we're going to chat here tonight about what's going on. So, with that all being said, I've kind of teed this all up and hopefully, you know, let Tracy take a little time here and talk about diabetes and some of the criteria that's out there and pre diabetes and the metabolic syndrome. So, Tracy, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Greg. So, yeah, you know, you you have set this up well for the discussion, um, you know, in determining the 
fact that we know that there are patients who take some of these medications, including metformin, um, that do not have full-blown diabetes. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, there's a decent amount of evidence out there now, um, just speaking about metformin, you know, that it could be a cancer preventive medication, that it might actually be a complementary therapy in the treatment of cancer as well. So, um, there, there are a lot of jobs that metformin can do uh, in patients, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they have diabetes. So just real quick, we want to differentiate between full-blown diabetes, um, whether it's type 1 or type 2, uh, uh, as opposed to metabolic syndrome. And even with metabolic syndromes, uh, like diabetes, there are um, different levels of those diagnoses. So before we get into the meds, you'll hear uh, us talk about some of these terms. I just want to run through the quick diagnostic criteria for full-blown diabetes. Um, fasting plasma glucose greater than or equal to 126. Um, and then, you know, you can see what fasting is determined um, or the definition of that. You can do a two-hour post-prandial uh, or post-eating um, uh, blood glucose level as well. But then what we really rely on, particularly with medications, is this second uh, or the hemoglobin A1C greater than or equal to 6.5%. And if you recall, the hemoglobin A1C or the A1C, uh, just kind of as the colloquially, colloquialism of that, um, we get a valuable piece of information for that. And that's from that. And that's why we use this with our medications so frequently. It's our main measurement for looking at whether or not a medication is doing its job in a patient who has metabolic syndrome or full-blown diabetes. And that's because it measures the average blood glucose over three months. So it's kind of, um, it's kind of a way in which you can evaluate a patient's um, level of metabolic dysfunction without them being able to kind of trick the system. So in other words, if somebody knows they're going to go get, you know, their blood glucose drawn on Friday, they can be very careful about what they eat on Wednesday, Thursday, and it will absolutely make that um, blood glucose look better. Not so easy with the hemoglobin A1C. So let's see. I think I'm gonna to have to take over the remote here, Greg. I'll take that from you. I'm requesting it here. So as we um, you know, move into some of the other criteria here, there are uh, lots of things on this list. So let's look at just a couple of them, the criteria for testing diabetes or prediabetes. So we um, always look for patients who are overweight or obese, and there are very specific BMI criteria for that. First degree relative with diabetes, there are high risk ethnicities as well. If patients have presented with cardiovascular disease, that CVD, hypertension, high cholesterol, in women who have, we were talking about this in the chat, I'll highlight it here with my mouse, women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, that PCOS, physical inactivity and other conditions that go hand in hand with insulin resistance like severe obesity, um, et, et cetera. So, you know, the interesting thing that isn't on this list other than really looking at that first degree relative or even the high, rate, high risk ethnicities is your genetics. You know, that plays a huge role in whether or not somebody who's overweight or obese um, will in fact develop um, diabetes. And it's something that's, you know, really being studied uh, in, in great, amounts in many places right right now. So let's look at uh, a few other things. I think this is uh, kind of Greg and his diagnosis code diagnosis codes here, but it's just once again looking at pre-diabetes. Here we have that fasting plasma glucose at 100 milligrams uh, per deciliter and the two hour postprandial um, at a range of 140 to 199. So our numbers are going to be a little bit different. They're also going to be a little bit different as it pertains to the hemoglobin A1C. So we are going to look at this. Um, oh, and that's this is a good question in the chat here. I see pop up before we go right into the meds. So it says, are the Dexcom G6 and the Freestyle Libre technology uh, better data giving better data on average blood sugar than the hemoglobin A1C? That's a really good question. And I would say 
preliminary data, preliminary gut feeling would say probably because for those of you who don't know what the Dexcom 6 is um, or the um, Freestyle Libre, these are units that attach to a patient's, typically their arm, that measures blood glucose constantly. And I would say in general, what we're going to find, I bet over time is that we do get better numbers or better, more accurate readings from those long-term devices, because again, there's no way to kind of trick the system. And what I mean by that is I already said how you can trick just going to a finger stick or going to get your blood glucose drawn at your PCP. But with hemoglobin A1C, you can also kind of trick the system a little bit in that if it's measuring three months of time, that hemoglobin A1C is doing the average blood glucose over three months. If a patient knows they're gonna go get their hemoglobin A1C drawn at the end of June, they can really have strict control of their activity and what they eat for those last couple of weeks. And it will have a greater impact on the hemoglobin A1C number than the previous two and a half months. So yeah, I would say that those devices are going to give a, a better read overall. It's just that we don't have a lot of patients using them yet. And I can come on, comment on that because on my end is about six patients in my practice that have them. And I can tell you that, you know, you know, we, they weren't really trying to trick the system. They were just having trouble kind of figuring out why, oh, yeah. you know, where their issues were. Right. So this kind of everyday kind of live data really, I mean, they love them. I mean, they're just like, oh, yeah. they feel better. Their sugars are better, well, better controlled. So this definitely, in my opinion, is going to be, you know, the wave of the future and who knows, you know, maybe it'll tie into Apple watches and all this kind of measuring oh, devices bet. that are out there. Can you go back two slides since you have control and I, sure. I won't request it back because you kind of mentioned about the, you know, the codes. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's important for we as optometrists to know these codes. Um, Sorry, and what you want to do is not just okay. kind of code everyone as an, as an E11, you know, 0.9 or an E whatever, because eventually when all this data starts showing up, you know, you're going to have conflicting and then the PCPs and the endocrinologist and everyone that's involved is going to have to have, you know, kind of have to sort it out. Now you could have a patient that, um, has diabetic retinopathy and maybe their E 11.9, whatever that shows, you know, minimal diabetic retinopathy or mild de diabetic retinopathy is the most appropriate code. But if you're, you know, if your patient comes in and they say, Hey, I'm pre-diabetes don't, you know, in a sense do E 11.9, there is a code that, that that's out there. That's R 73.03. And that is a code that you can bill and you're, you know, the, the doc wants to know the primary care doc or the endocrinologist wants you to do an eye exam and give you the, the, the recordings back. And, you know, is there any retinopathy or what's the eye findings? So that is the pre-diabetes code R73.03. Got it. Yeah. And as we move back um, to the, to the other slide, going back to those long-term um, measuring tools that people are using, I, I think, you know, from a pharmacist perspective, the, the hardest thing right now is getting insurance to pay for them. If insurance is, if insurance companies would pay for those devices outright for every patient with type one or type two diabetes, um, which I think is coming, um, we would just have a remarkable amount of data for our patients. Let me go back one slide and touch on this, Tracy, because the, 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 the title of this talk is metabolic disease, but there is a condition out there. Some believe it, some don't, and there's where some of the confusion is, and that means some PCPs believe it, some don't, where the metabolic syndrome is this cluster of conditions that increase the risk of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, dementia, and cancer. And uh, either Tracy or someone along the line kind of taught me, you know, why is cancer always on here? And, you know, cancer loves sugar. So there's a condition out here that's not metabolic diseases. We kind of talked about all those, but there's a condition again, like PCPs, most of them believe in it. Some don't, eh, it doesn't really exist, but that's why we need to talk about it. You know, it's called metabolic syndrome and it's this cluster of conditions where, you know, elevated glucose or what you consider insulin resistance or people running hemoglobin A1Cs greater than 6.5, blood pressure is systolic, just constantly above 120, obese, overweight, BMI, um, 
Yeah, I'm doing a lot of work in the nutritional area now because my patients have asked me, hey, doc, you know, and 86% of the patients coming in are on, are on uh, some type of supplement. And I'm you know, learning that, you know, fat is an organ and it needs to live. And, you know, sometimes if you're trying to work on, you know, your carotenoid levels that the fat will absorb them. And, you know, maybe that little spinach that you're eating that day is not helping out. So that's where obese and overweight, if you can lose some weight, it takes away some of the living tissue there that's out there. And especially that abdominal obesity. And then there's abnormal cholesterol ratios or more what's being considered dyslipidemia out there. You know, maybe it's high, but maybe the ratios are right. Maybe it's the ratios that are bad. And then you have these pro-inflammatory uh, and pro-thrombotic states that are out there. And to meet the criteria for metabolic syndrome, three out of these five, if you have them, then you now you're increasing your risk for heart disease and stroke. So someone that's kind of eh, insulin resistant or maybe not diabetic, maybe that's how they end up on metformin or that's how they end up on lisinopril. Maybe not true high blood pressure, but they got this little cluster of being overweight and the sugar that's borderline and blood pressure that's borderline. And they have three of the five and they say, you know what, we know that this leads to you know, heart disease and stroke. And there's actually, if you just go to ICD-10 uh, data, you can see right here, it says metabolic syndrome. It's E88.81. And these patients do come in uh, uh, with, uh, with, with this diagnosis. And you can see here that there's a whole bunch of clinical data that's out there. And it says it's a cluster of metabolic risk factors for cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, the major components of this metabolic syndrome X, right, Trace? Isn't that what you taught me? It was called metabolic syndrome X at one point. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, and here it is in this coding definition. And you can see down here, metabolic syndrome is a group of clusters, put your patient at risk for heart disease and diabetes. So that's why you know, your, your docs might say, or your patients might say, well, my doc didn't say that I was diabetic, but I'm on metformin. And my doc didn't say as hypertension, they're just trying to prevent me from becoming diabetes or heart disease. And look at this right here, where it says, not all doctors agree on the definition or the cause of metabolic syndrome. So then that even adds the confusion, you know, this PC believes in it and this one doesn't and so on and so forth. So with that being said, I'm going to launch the poll. Maybe. Here we go. Have you ever billed E88.1 on for metabolic syndrome? So the key is I'm just trying to bring attention to these codes. Yeah, I try to get the, pay, the, the primary care docs codes and I try to get them to match up as close as possible. Um, I'm doing some direct messaging. I'm getting these CCDAs. I'm looking at them. We're trying to consume them into the record. Um, so I want the codes to match. And it actually gives me a little bit better idea what's what's going on. And then when I send my reports back, everything kind of lines up. So we talked about the R code for prediabetes. And then there's the metabolic syndrome that's out there, you know, for your patients. And you can see here, I'll end the poll that, you know, this, there's just a handful of our docs that have built this condition. Uh, or this ICD-10 code in the majority of us that haven't. So the, pay, the primary care doc says it's a metabolic syndrome and they want you to do an eye exam. I usually build the E88.81 and that's the, uh, you know, the reason why we do these, do these talks. All right, let's see what's next after this. So metabolic diseases and the syndrome, you know, what's optometry's role, you know, what's the future? You know, I do a lot of political stuff. You know, I was the president of POA, as, as Joe mentioned, in 2010. You know, I work with Salas closely. I work with, I uh, was on the AOA board for three years. You know, and there's all this, you know, debate out there is, you know, or some d discussion that's out there, you know, optometry. Maybe they should be in the role of diabetes and, and high blood pressure and all this other stuff. And, you know, we're getting all this pushback. There's like, there's no way I'm prescribing metformin. And I don't really think that that's where, you know, the, 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 the leaders and the thinkers are going is that optometry is going to be prescribing metformin. But there we have these patients that come in and we can take their weight. We can look at them. We see them the first time that optometry could be the first time that we're seeing these patients uh, that are out there. Oops, what happened there? 
All right, let's share a screen. So let's get back to that. So optometry's role would be not really treating and, you know, hey, we're going to put you on a, on a Dexcom 6, you know, six generation, so on and so forth. But what they're saying is we could get the patient, run the blood work, and then these at-risk patients get them to a PCP that's out there. So that's really when you hear that talk out there about maybe optometry's role in the future will be ordering the blood work for these high risk people. The first time that they're really entering, we see a lot. I see patients all the time. I don't have a PCP. This is my first eye doc, this and that. I'm having trouble seeing up close. And, you know, we take a blood pressure in the office and it's high and, you know, we get them, you know, we try to get them to a PCP, but maybe that's our role is to maybe do a little bit more digging. And if they have more factors, then we can encourage them to go and get, you know, get a, get a checkup. So that's really when you hear what's optometry's role in the future, what they're talking about. So again, with that being said, you're probably going to hear a lot more from Tracy now than me, because she's going to talk a lot about these agents that are out there, hopefully to give you a little bit more comfort when you see them in the practice. Um, but Tracy, you know, this is one of my favorite things because you taught me about this. So I threw this polling question in here. You know, are you familiar, the people that are on this call, are you familiar with the Incretin system? You know, never heard of it, no. Greg, while that's rolling in, we've got a couple questions in the chat or comments. One is, I was advised never to code uh, diabetic retinopathy before a patient has been diagnosed as diabetic. Well, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, that's, you know, I'm not sure really how to answer that. If a patient is not diabetic and they come in and, you know, you test their sugar in the office, if you have a finger stick and it's 300 and they have some, um, uh, you know, vascular changes, you know, maybe you can wait to get them to the PCP before you could, uh, you know, call them as diabetic, um, but, you know, most of these patients that I'm talking about tonight have come in with a diagnosis of a metabolic disease or diabetes or pre-diabetes. If they're pre-diabetes and they got vascular changes, you can certainly change their diagnosis to diabetic retinopathy because that's what the PCP, that's why they're using us as optometrists. You know, they, they want us to give them, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I'm going to kind of change the subject here. You know, a patient comes in and they have, they have shingles and it's affecting their the V1, the ophthalmic division. Patient comes into the office and they're already on Valtrex, they're already on a steroid because they're maybe trying to prevent maybe a Bell's palsy and they're sitting there in the chair and what do they want? You know, what do, what do they want me to do as an optometrist? Well, they know that diabetes can affect anywhere from the tear film to the cornea, to the anterior chamber with iritis, to the lens, to the retina with retinitis and optic neuritis, they want a good comprehensive exam and report back. So in this case, the patient's not diabetic and they're sending them over to you. Maybe they're using prediabetes or whatever. That's what we're there for to help make that conversion and report back. And then they can use that data and they'll probably call them a diabetic at that point. So anything else? So check oh. this out, Trace. Oh. Yeah. five people familiar with the in Cretan. So the others that were no and never heard of it, that's where I was. Tracy started one day <laughs> talking about the in Cretan system. I said, spell that, give it to me. What? Huh? So any you other things I in the comments? Cretan. So anything else in the comments there? Uh, no, it was just kind of, you know, a little more chatter okay. talking about, you know, not being diagnosed with diabetes yet and the diabetic retinopathy. So the incretin system is important because there's where, you know, Tracy has a pharmacist and where I like to get involved in talking about medication is the mechanism of actions. Where are these and how these medications work? So you kind of have to understand the incretin system and you see that there's memetics and inhibitors and so on and so forth. So Trace, you taught me. So why don't you kind of take this slide and explain it? Sure. Uh, you want to make it a slideshow presentation mode? Uh, what's happening? I see it on my end. Uh, no, well, it's uh, the notes are on the side. 
I mean, we can certainly work with it otherwise. I'm not sure what's happening. Uh, let me see. Even 15 months later, all the kinks can't get worked out with COVID I mean, technology. My end, it looks good. That's why I'm just a little uh, confused. And then we'll have to roll with it because I don't yeah, see we'll it. roll with it. In the meantime, I can talk about the in Cretan system. Oh, there we go. Perfect. So the in Cretan system, well, first of all, in Cretan is a good thing. So um, it's one of the newer areas that researchers and chemists um, decided to use as a target for patients with uh, metabolic syndrome to some extent, but definitely diabetes. And what we know is that really these medications in the, in, that work on the incretin system, either as um, what we call a mimetic, uh, a drug that mimics incretin, or as one that is an inhibitor of the breakdown of incretin, we know that they are very powerful drugs that control blood sugar. As a matter of fact, they really are, you'll see here the names in a moment, but they really are kind of the closest thing that we have uh, recently to metformin, which has been around for, you know, 25, 25 plus or minus some odd years. And the reason why these drugs are so fantastic is because they work in multiple different areas of the body because in Cretin is something that very tightly controls uh, blood sugar and metabolism to some extent as well. So what you have here, um, you can see this in Cretan mimetic. We'll look at those first. Um, it works in the pancreas, but it also is um, working in the stomach, in the brain, et cetera. So you're going to see that the drugs that have an impact on the in Cretan system will control blood glucose, they will tell the body or have, you know, essentially tell the brain that um, you're full faster than you would normally feel full. And it also actually tells the body to release insulin in response to eating, which is something that is uh, to some extent not working as well in um, patients with type 2 diabetes in particular. So we'll look at some of these meds here and talk a little bit about why they are so fantastic. Um, all right, I'm getting my remote control here. There we go. All right, so next, um, just real quick comment to make. It's, it's an observation for you to kind of, you know, keep in mind as you have patients coming in and sitting across from you, it's gonna help you sort of um, sort through why they are on the medications that they are on. So I'm going to give you a couple of ways to kind of qualify a situation. So type one diabetes, you already know that for the most part, it's just the pancreatic beta cells are no longer working. Um, either they're severely uh, affected or absolutely lacking the ability to, um, to squirt out insulin in response to high blood glucose. So we know that there's definitely a genetic component to that as well. There probably is an autoimmune component that we've learned. But one thing that you're going to see in most patients with type 1 diabetes, this is a gross generalization, but there's truth in it. Most patients with type 1 diabetes tend to be on the thin side for the most part, not always, but for the most part. Type 2 diabetes, on the other hand, you know, do have some pancreatic dysfunction as well uh, somewhere along the way. But the biggest problem in most patients with type 2 diabetes is this sort of long-standing inflammatory process and metabolic syndrome where the patient actually for, for years before they actually were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, um, they had hyperinsulinemia. So the pancreas was squirting out plenty of insulin, as a matter of fact, way too much insulin, but it's almost like the body has forgotten what to do with that insulin. So this hyperinsulinemia uh, ultimately results in insulin resistance. Insulin resistance or a decrease in insulin sensitivity is a beast to try and fix. But now with metformin and some of our other newer medications, as well as um, you know, getting rid of that sedentary lifestyle, changing some things about it, about your diet, really can also have an impact on a patient with type two diabetes. So we actually have medications now that can kind of reteach put it in air quotes, uh, reteach the body how to use the insulin that's there. Wonderful medications. Metformin is one of them.
We seem to be having a problem, Greg. Good. All right, can you forward? It's not letting me. Uh, there we go. So we already said hemoglobin A1C. I'm going to make a quick comment on this because every hemoglobin A1C is not created equal. When we look at our medications and what our ultimate goal is for the hemoglobin A1C in patients with type 2 diabetes in particular, we know a couple of things. We know that, you know, 6.5, 6.87 is too high. We really want patients, you know, less than 7% for the most part. If a patient is one of those people where you look like if you blew on them too hard that the wind might take them and they would fall over and crack in half. Um, those patients we know we want usually around 6.5 or closer to 7% because the lower the hemoglobin A1C, the lower the blood sugar, the lower the blood sugar, um, you know, kind of across the board, the increased chance of hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is an acute killer in patients with diabetes. And it's one of the, the really scary things that we have to watch with our medications. Now, if it's a more robust patient, um, you know, uh, that looks like not, not much is going to rattle them. Um, they're sturdy. They don't really have friable diabetes. Those patients, we tend to be able to uh, control a little bit more tightly. And that's actually the word we use. We, we have more tight control of their blood glucose, which ultimately results in a lower hemoglobin A1C. But notice in both of these cases with our medications, this one is a more stable or sturdy patient. We still want our hemoglobin A1C. It says less than or equal to 6.5%. And on the bottom, it says A1C greater than 6.5%, kind of approaching seven in a patient who's not as stable or a little more friable. Notice we don't really have a lot of movement there because what we also know is that patients that sit at 6% or less with diabetes, without diabetes, you should have a hemoglobin A1C at 5.5, 5.6, 5.7, 5.8. But patients with diabetes, they already have the, the disease, the closer to 6% we get, or even a little bit less, the higher the chance of heart attack um, and other cardiovascular manifestations. So um, there's a lot to juggle here with our medications. So and Trace, with that being yeah. said, I just want to make the comment. And it's, again, I work with a lot of payers that are out there. And you know, a lot of the reasons why um, you know, primary care docs are really sticklers about some of this is they, you know, they're incentivized to make sure that a patient gets a dilated exam, but also there's different benchmarks and not every insurance company is like this, but most of them have different benchmarks. If someone comes in as a, you know, a, above an eight, um, you know, say they're 8.9 or a nine on a hemoglobin A1C, you know, they're incentivized to get them below an eight and then they're incentivized to get them below a seven. So um, just so you know, there is a lot of, you know, because we do know, as Tracy said, you get those numbers down, um, it decreases the risk of heart attack, you know, and, and better quality of life. So there's a lot of incentivizing that's out there. Go ahead. Yeah. And insurances, you know, with that, insurances are now paying for kind of preventive medicine, which, you know, even less than 10 years ago, they weren't willing to pay for that. And um, this is one of the one of the good things that's happening. So a couple quick updates, um, not that this particular statement is an update, but you'll see kind of how the medications fill, fit into these updates on treatment. With type one patients, you know, it's pretty much always been exogenous insulin injections. So exogenous just means you're taking a chemical from the outside in, i.e. medications. So we do have newer insulin products that are wonderful. And these newer insulin products are used in type one, as well as in type two patients. We see many more patients with type two diabetes on the newer types of insulin because they offer good flexibility. And they also give kind of what we call basal control of blood glucose. And that means they really closely mimic what the pancreas would do if it didn't have dysfunction. So the newer insulins, you can come up with a regimen for a patient, whether it's type one or type two, that so closely mimics what their endogenous, their internal pancreatic function um, would be doing if they didn't have diabetes. Um, never before we've been able to do that so well. So it's exciting stuff. 
So um, type two metformin is still our first line agent. It's the gold standard to which all others are compared. We want to use metformin in pretty in, in every patient, really. I mean, I could probably think of an exception if I thought about it really hard, but other than having just flat contraindications to metformin, um, we really want to use it. And for the most part, if somebody's going to have a contraindication to metformin, it's going to be a renal issue. So their kidneys can't handle it. You will occasionally have patients whose gut can't handle metformin. Metformin tends to be tough on the stomach. And in, uh, I know a few patients who, you know, have kind of had almost like irritable bowel on it that was never able to, uh, get controlled. So they ultimately had to go off metformin, um, which is a shame, but so unless there's an allergy or some other contraindication, we really want patients to be on metformin. The comment below this type two here, it says if hemoglobin A1C is greater than 10% and or blood glucose is greater than 300 milligrams per deciliter, it is pretty much a fait accompli that the patient will need at least two agents. Now that doesn't mean that we will always start a patient on two agents. It's rare that we wanna start somebody on two drugs on the same day because what happens if the patient has side effects? We're not gonna know which agent it came from. As a matter of fact, the other thing to consider is um, the hypoglycemia, which is really a side effect, a function of the medications. Um, you know, we, we're really worried about causing hypoglycemia acutely. Hyperglycemia tends to be a long-term killer. Hypoglycemia tends to be the acute killer. So we have to juggle all of these um, issues simultaneously. But when we have hemoglobin A1C that's greater than 10%, which, oh, by the way, notice in this line, it says 10% hemoglobin A1C, 300 milligrams per deciliter blood glucose. Essentially what that means, it's, it's not it's not um, just random that these two numbers are side by side. If somebody's walking around with a hemoglobin A1C of 10%, it averages out that your blood glucose is about 300 milligrams per deciliter um, or within that range all the time, most of the time. That's how you get the hemoglobin A1C of 10%. That's crazy high blood glucose, scary high blood glucose. So um, those, those numbers don't seem quite as scary when you're looking at it from a patient's perspective and they're like, well, I'm only at nine and a half percent. Well, that means your blood glucose is about 250 to 260 um, milligrams per deciliter on average all day long. So um, there's actually a newer measurement that's coming out um, that is looking at average blood glucose uh, for patients as well. And it's an easier way for them to assess the numbers. But what we wanna do, think about this. If hemoglobin A1C is 10%, we wanna get the patient to 6.5. Metformin can't do that as a single agent. The, if, if it is perfectly used in a patient's body, if we put metformin on and the patient takes it perfectly, it works perfectly, the stars align, everything goes great. The maximum amount that metformin can decrease hemoglobin A1C is 2% in utopia. And it usually tends to be more along the lines of 1% or 1.5%. So we're definitely gonna need at least one more agent, sometimes two. Patients end up on you know two, three, four agents for their diabetes. Um, I would be loath if I didn't at least mention gestational diabetes. We used to always use insulin injections and somebody had gestational diabetes, but now metformin is also generally the standard of care for gestational diabetes. So it wears many hats. The beauty of um, these medications is they work along with the basic mechanisms of dysfunction in a patient with type two diabetes. And again, this is the majority of the patients. The primary dysfunction in these patients is that hyperinsulinemia, which results in insulin resistance. So when you think about it, every time patient's blood sugar goes above normal, the body in type two diabetes, whatever's left of the pancreas, it's going to continue to kind of squirt out more insulin. The problem is once the insulin is in the bloodstream, Stream, the body doesn't know what to do with it anymore. It's, it's, you know, it's lost its threshold uh, and for numbers of blood glucose, whatever those numbers are. And really, instead of just using insulin to, to use glucose as fuel, it starts shoving sugar into fat.
adipose tissue and it just becomes a vicious cycle. Metformin and our incretin agents are some of the medications that can actually kind of reteach the body how to use insulin. That is why they are so important in our, our anti-diabetes arsenal. So look at the middle here. I just have here insulin and insulin secreting meds cause hypoglycemia and weight gain. One of the biggest things that we fight with our medications over time is that traditionally the only drugs we had for decades were insulin and our um, sulfonylureas like glipizide, glimepiride, gliburide, et cetera. Those are very likely to cause hypoglycemia because they tell the pancreas to release more insulin. That's all they do. And um, they cause weight gain over time. Because again, think about it. In a type two patient, we're trying to fix that insulin resistance. If we're not fixing that insulin resistance, if we're just telling the body to release more insulin to try to overcome the insulin resistance, it's we're feeding the beast. We're feeding that beast of insulin uh, decreased insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance. So the next one um, line says we need meds that reteach the body how to use the endogenous insulin that's there and whatever the medications are adding as well. All drugs are not created equal for sure. So the last thing I'll say here before we jump into uh, the meds real quick um, individually is that we look at the side effect comparison and I, I love this way of thinking. It's my, how my brain works, but it works really effectively with um, the prediabetes, metabolic syndrome, type one, type two, et cetera. Drugs that have a high incidence of hypoglycemia. So if your patients come in and they say they're feeling dizzy or um, you know, they're sweating or anything like that, and you know they have diabetes, it might be from their medication causing hypoglycemia. And the biggest offenders are those drugs that are what we call insulin secretagogues. Um, I mean, I guess in the non-pharmacy world, we like to make things complicated in pharmacology, but we could just say drugs that make the body squirt out more insulin. They're called insulin secretagogues. So actual insulin, because you're just adding more to the body, are sulfonylureas. Uh, you'll see what those are here in a second as a reminder, and our maglitinides. So... Um, then we have at the bottom drugs that cause weight loss or are weight neutral. How amazing is that? By, by having an impact on that insulin's resistance, by decreasing that insulin resistance and making the body more sensitive to insulin, we can actually help patients lose weight with the medications. So all other drugs cause weight gain over time, except metformin. And then you have after metformin, our two incretin agents, our GLP-1 agonists, our DPP-4 inhibitors, and our SGLT-2 inhibitors. It's like alphabet soup, but we'll look at what those drugs are quickly. Keep in mind, if you have patients coming in and you know, you're evaluating their medications as you're doing their exam, um, and just, you know, from a very basic perspective, if you see they're on more than one anti-diabetic medication, the chances of hypoglycemia are much higher. Um, so it's just another monitoring parameter, you know, making sure your patients are feeling good, particularly as it starts to get real hot out. And um, sometimes that changes diets. Hey, so Tracy, long, I got a question yeah. for you. Whenever I was back at PCO back in the day, 1991 to 95, did a residency 90 five to 96. I mean, on, on, on a daily basis, there was a code blue called and someone that was a patient with diabetes, you know, obviously took too much insulin, they didn't eat, and then they're crashing. And, you know, we're, we're trying to get, you know, a candy in or some type of orange juice to help. Because you're saying here, you know, hypoglycemia can kill the patient. You know, there really hasn't been knock on wood, you know, in, in the offices, code blues really anymore. What's changed in the medication? You know, is it just that we know that this can happen or, um, is, or, is it, or has there been a change in the mechanism of actions of these that we don't really see a lot of the, um, the, the you know, the, the, the low hypoglycemic patient? Yeah, I think it's a great question. It's really a combination of both. I mean, in type two diabetes in particular, I would say the, you know, really more geared towards our mechanisms have changed. And, and even those medications that can cause hypoglycemia, we use them differently, you know, like along with metformin or something else. In type one patients, I think we've just gotten better at monitoring them. 
um, and watching for the signs and symptoms associated with hypoglycemia and making sure you know, it's education, educating the patients. But since we're talking about metabolic syndrome and prediabetes and all that, it's really mechanism-based. And this metformin is exactly what I've been saying as the initial drug of choice or a cornerstone of therapy for type two diabetes. It has other mechanisms that are significant to treating a patient, but the real key is that helping to treat the insulin resistance. We also um, you know, have slight changes in um, renal gluconeogenesis as well as hepatic gluconeogenesis. But the key thing to really kind of hone in on here is that metformin does not tell the pancreas to release more insulin. So it's not stressing the pancreas. It's not adding more insulin to the bloodstream that's going to kind of continue to feed the beast of insulin resistance. It's a really remarkable drug. Then I put the sulfonylureas right after metformin because for years we had metformin and sulfonylureas neck and neck for first line therapy. And it was kind of like, well, if you have a patient who comes in with type two diabetes and they're, you know, they're a little overweight or they're morbidly obese, they probably do better on metformin, but we've had the sulfonylureas forever. So if you really like those and you're comfortable with them, just use the sulfonylurea. And thank goodness, these have now been removed as first line therapy. So you recognize some of these, gliburide, glipizide, glimepiride. These are our prime example of an insulin secretagogue. These go in and tell a sick pancreas to work harder. These go in and tell a sick pancreas to release more insulin. And while that helps the patient acutely, these do lower blood glucose pretty quickly not as fast as insulin, but pretty close, or insulin injections, I should say, these are not helping the patient long-term. As a matter of fact, I should make the comment that metformin is the only drug that is proven to decrease morbidity and mortality in a patient with type 2 diabetes. I mean, think about that. Why the heck do you want to shove a pill down your gullet for the rest of your life if it's not going to make you live better and longer? Metformin has the data to show, you know, decreased morbidity and mortality. That's remarkable. The sulfonylureas you will still see in some patients, but it's usually because this is a patient that may need three, four meds to tr control their diabetes. Sulfonylureas um, also um, cause hypoglycemia. I just want to echo Trace. I can't tell you how many times, you know, say 20 years ago, patients were coming in on glyburide and uh, and metformin, and now that has changed. You know, you oh, yeah. never see the that 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 other one, but that makes total sense now. Yeah, you know, it really was you know, probably the best thing they had at the time, but newer and better things came out because it like, why would you want to squeeze more insulin out if there's an issue? So yeah, it helps oh, yeah. clarify that. Thank you. And, you know, it's, uh, I could tell you, you know, I've been a pharmacist for, I don't know, 26, 27 years. I, if when I was a dispensing pharmacist, I, I would do probably, I don't know, 50 prescriptions a day of just the sulfonylureas, at least, at least on a 300 prescription day, I would do 50 that were just those. And now I probably wouldn't do more than one in a day if I did one and so much metformin, you can't even count. There was an interesting question that popped up that said, um, you know, there's some, small studies that look at long-term metformin potentially contributing to Alzheimer's disease. It's a great question, um, but I will make maybe make an argumentative point that says that there's probably as much, if not more information suggesting that maybe metformin decreases Alzheimer's disease and cancer and other inflammatory conditions. So I don't think that we have the, uh, the whole story on that yet. Um, it's a great question and every medication is a potential poison. So there are so many dynamics that contribute to Alzheimer's disease that um, as a matter of fact, keep your eyes peeled and your ears open because um, there are some scientists and great minds and research that actually call Alzheimer's disease um, type three diabetes. So um, that really hasn't kind of taken, taken, um, taken hold yet in the medical community, but showing you that there is um, a metabolic component to Alzheimer's disease for sure. So it's a great point. I, yeah, I don't and know probably the, the other thing to, to look at it that way, Trace, is that, you know, the patients that are pre-diabetes, it's 
probably more of an eating issue. You know, you, you listen to a lot of the nutritional people out there. We have bad food sources, you know, an orange nowadays takes 21 oranges from the one from 1953. The, the foods are grown fast and quickly. They don't have the nutrient density. So, you know, if you look at, you know, Alzheimer's disease, um, kind of being tied to carotenoids, which are then fatty uh, substances and diabetes is poor nutrition. You know, it's all kind of coming down and narrowing into these kind of these poor nutritional areas. Um, and then you put someone on metformin. So I agree, I, you, know, you know, there might be a study out there that shows that, that there's metformin maybe contribute, but it's probably not the metformin. It's probably the overall uh, poor nutrition of this patient. And that's why you can get someone pre-diabetes. If you change their nutrition, you can probably get most of those people to revert back. But I heard someone say it's easier to change someone's religion than to change their eating habits. So <laughs> that's an interesting point. Uh, and you know, I, it makes me think too, with the question with the metformin and the Alzheimer's, um, you know, we have good data suggesting that the statins, you know, in people who are genetically predisposed to have a problem with statins, statins can sometimes um, call, cause an Alzheimer's type um, presentation in patients because they're robbing the body of fat and our brain is 60% fat. So that we do have, not across the board, it's only certain patients that are at risk, but don't forget our insulin preps. This is just, I love these little pocket cards. Um, so I just plopped this one in here just because it has some of the big names. But if you see the categories here on the left, starting with rapid acting insulin, the two biggest categories of insulin that you'll see in your patients, which you would recognize some of these will be the rapid acting insulin and the long acting insulin or a combination of the two. You know, I'm old enough to have um, lived through, everybody was on NPH, which was intermediate and regular insulin. We still use regular insulin uh, sometimes, mostly inpatient or sometimes in an insulin pump. But the reason why we love the rapid acting insulins as long as the long, as well as the long acting, excuse me, Levomir, Lantus, Tujeo, and then you see the rapid acting Novolog, Humalog, et cetera, is because the long acting insulin gives you that nice basal control. Most of the time patients take it at night and it gives you what it gives you basically insulin levels that look like what your body would have if it didn't have diabetes. And then the rapid acting or rapid onset insulins are typically given right around mealtime because just like a patient without diabetes, you get a spike in your insulin when you eat to control blood sugar. So it's a wonderful combination of of um, products in our patients. And we do see these used in both type one and type two diabetes. We will not choose insulin over metformin in a patient with diabetes if we can all at all help it. It just doesn't do the same thing. We need that metabolic fixer in the case of metformin or one of our incretin drugs. Here's this glucagon-like peptide one agonist. We shorten everything, GLP-1 agonist, but um, glucagon-like peptide one is in cretin. So you recognize some of these names, Bieta, Victoza, Tanzium, Trulicity, Ozempic, Adelixin, these, uh, I think, are mostly good. They make me a little bit nervous, um, you know, looking at kind of the long game in some scenarios, but time will tell. Um, the most commonly used agent in this group is Victoza. And that's kind of because it was the second agent that came out, but also because liraglutide chemically looks closest to our internal incretin system. They're chemically very similar. Um, notice under liraglutide brand name Victoza, we also have a liraglutide brand name Saxenda, still liraglutide, different brand name, and it's only indicated for weight loss. So once again, a GLP-1 type drug, these incretin drugs, they're metabolic fixers similar to metformin. And um, I already uh, I already said a little bit about this. Oh, I, I, I opened my mouth, my big mouth too soon. Somebody asked how, why do they make me a little bit nervous? Well, you know, people think that because you're a pharmacist that you must love drugs. 
And the truth of the matter is most pharmacists become pharmacists either because you get paid well or because you love chemistry. I did it because I just loved biochemistry and medicinal chemistry. Um, and I wanted to do something in medicine. So with that being said, you know, most pharmacists are, you know, have pretty healthy respect of what happens when drugs go in the body. And the truth of the matter is every single drug that we take, every cream we use on our body, every, you know, processed food we put across our tongues that we swallow um, has the ability to become um, a poison to the body, you know, with preservatives and chemicals and everything like that. Um, that being said, you know, we know kind of what happens acutely, but we should be more worried about what happens long term. We have good longitudinal data now with our GLP-1 agonists with Bieta and Victoza, et cetera. It makes me a little bit nervous only because there's so much that's in intermingled here between, you know, the genetic predisposition to certain things in people, then you're adding a, a drug to the mix, um, you know, pancreatitis is something that I think about that these drugs, the GLP-1 agonists and the DPP-4 inhibitors can stress the pancreas out a little bit. So once again, I would say what I just said about insulin, and that is we have used metformin for a long time. So if we can get the most mileage out of metformin as possible, that's what we want to do. If we have to add something to further lower the hemoglobin A1c, we can do it with one of these drugs as well. It's just that we don't, we haven't had them as long and I always wanna see that long-term data. So, you know, they, they look good. They work for patients, absolutely. All right, so let's keep moving here. We've got our DPP-4 inhibitors. So these are in Cretan drugs as well um, that um, are inhibiting the breakdown of in Cretan. So they sort of do the same thing, but they don't do it quite as efficiently. Um, and these are oral. So if a patient says, no way in hell am I going to inject Victo uh, Victoza or Bieta, I'm not going to inject myself, no way, nope, 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 then, you know, sometimes we'll go to a DPP-4 inhibitor, but they're not quite as good as the GLP-1 agonists, but they do increase in cretin as well. So metformin uh, is effective, but also safe long-term. Yeah, I would say that that's a, a great assessment. Um, that, you know, we, metformin is a, is a safe drug in most cases as well. And then lastly, our SGLT2 inhibitors. These have been in the, in the news here on and off um, before the pandemic, because then it was kind of not that significant. But again, now that things are winding down, we have the flozins, the canagliflozin in Bocana. There was that drug we saw earlier, dipagliflozin, farsiga, and pagliflozin, jardiance. Um, these tell the body to pee out more sugar. That's it. It's a pretty um, crusty mechanism in the sense that it's not that all, you know, not all that spectacular, but I kind of like these workhorse drugs that are just kind of shifting, um, shifting chemicals. And that's all this is doing is it's telling the body to pee out more sugar. Interesting in patients that have a really, really high risk of heart attack and stroke uh, with their diabetes, um, these decrease cardiovascular risk. So you see more people being put on these, especially Invokana and to some extent Jardians along with their metformin, et cetera, just because it um, lowers cardiac risk. So more time will tell on that. And then, you know, kind of to round out the discussion here, you know, Greg said at the beginning with the, the different uh, components of what contributes to metabolic disease um, and, you know, the different components that increase risk of heart attack and stroke and things like that. We have to mention hypertension, you know, these things go hand in hand. You look at like the, uh, the American triumvirate of doom, it's hypertension, it's diabetes and it's high cholesterol. Hypertension and diabetes, you can control well with diet and exercise. You, you can fix those typically, not always, but typically you can fix those two diseases and maybe even get off medications, diabetes and hypertension, at least for type two. Type one, you have to be on medication forever, as you know. Cholesterol is a little bit harder to control. Um, you know, a lot of it is from our genetic makeup. So um, that one's not quite as controllable with diet and exercise, but it budges a little. So these all go together. We have great new guidelines um, that are constantly updated for hypertension, um, where we saw some pretty big changes. You know, we wanna make sure our uh, blood 
our uh, blood pressure levels are, um, you know, within normal range. The newer guidelines, the JNCH, which is just a think tank that puts together treatment guidelines for hypertension, um, you know, bases it on age and other comorbidities. Hyperlipidemia, um, this also plays a role in our metabolic disease and inflammation, maybe contributing all of this together, maybe contributing to increased risk of cancer, increased risk of Alzheimer's disease long-term. And I saw one thing pop up, SGLT2 inhibitors are oral. So that's why people like them. So with our hyperlipidemia, we're going to see our um, statins used. Again, kind of like metformin, our statins are the only ones that uh, are only anti-lipid drugs that decrease morbidity and mortality long-term. We know that um, at the beginning, Greg made a comment about, you know, how do you know what the patient has if they're coming in on metformin and lisinopril? Do we always assume they have diabetes and hypertension? That was kind of a punt to this protein urea. The, the kidneys are not very, uh, they shouldn't spill protein into the urine um, because protein is a huge substance large substance, high molecular weight. So if you're spilling protein into your urine, um, that's a harbinger of doom. So lisinopril or any of the prills, the ACE inhibitors, or even any of the angiotensin receptor blockers, the sartans, they're renally protective. So even if a patient has perfect, perfect blood pressure, uh, patients with diabetes many times will get put on a ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker because it protects the kidneys for sure. And um, so sometimes patients will say, no, I don't have hypertension. They may not remember why they're on the ACE or the ARB, but it's um, protective for the kidneys. So that's a remarkable, remarkable thing. And then last couple things here, you know, just to kind of round out, I know we're heading to the end here. We've got just maybe a little more than 10 minutes left. You know, it was important for us to put in the C-reactive protein. And then the next slide is vitamin D and a couple of other things, because if you remember one thing that may seem like a huh moment during this lecture, it should be that inflammation is woven in and out of all of these different disorders, um, diseases, diagnoses, and inflammation as a risk factor is something that we know to be true. For instance, uh, I have rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. If you've heard me speak, I always say it because it's usually an example for something we're talking about. Um, C-reactive protein is something that is measured for chronic inflammation. But if a patient is um, obese, overweight, anything like that, and their blood sugar just pops up high now and again, kind of from a metabolic, um, metabolic disease, or pre-diabetes perspective, C-reactive protein increases just from that. So without rheumatoid arthritis, without diabetes, without ankylosing spondylitis, or you know, Phil Mickelson's playing tonight with uh, uh, psoriatic arthritis. So get rid of all those autoimmune diseases, you can still have high C-reactive protein just by having blood glucose that pops up high um, regularly and maybe overweight or obese C-reactive protein. So this inflammatory marker can contribute absolutely to heart attack, stroke, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, et cetera. So the next slide with vitamin D in particular, vitamin D not only helps your bones stay strong, vitamin D is also significant for um, cognitive function. Um, it's been studied greatly for um, vitamin D3 in particular. That's the best option here. I'm circling it. It's the most uh, well absorbed. It's also been studied for, you know, helping with decreased risk of COVID. And if you did get COVID, that your, your um, you know, COVID-19 disease would be less horrific than if you had um, low vitamin D3 levels. And then we have our B12, et cetera, like that. There's all of this is intermingled. You can't separate the nutritional component from the um, metabolic disease and inflammatory conditions. Hey, Chase, go back. I'm going to give you a little breather here because, you know, we see, you know, patients coming in all the time on D3 now. And, you know, the key is, is, is why is this? And you touched on it, you know, a lot of people think it's for osteoporosis and fractures, but it's been also linked if you have low D3 and you get above that 37th parallel, you know, it, it's also linked to heart disease, cancer. You talked about the immune function. 
And, you know, it is protective. It's a, you know, an antioxidant for lack of a better term. And you're talking about COVID, it helped with that, you know, cytokine storm that can occur. It also has been linked to dementia and Alzheimer's, I think you meant type two diabetes and depression. But, you know, I think the key is, is why do, why, why are you, you seeing a ton of patients coming in on it is because the primary care doc can measure. They can do a blood test, see that you're low. And then they put you on, you know, a, a, a supplement that helps helps treat it. But the key is, you know, it's nice seeing, uh, you know, the, 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 the primary care. And like you said a little bit earlier, moving into prevention. So, um, but, you know, I see a ton of people because we're above that 37th parallel and we're not getting that, that vitamin uh, D3 or that vitamin D that we're supposed to be getting. So. Yeah. And even if you do, I mean, I, I was covered in mud until 45 minutes before this program. I am outside all the time digging in the dirt and planting, et cetera, but my D3 levels are still low. You know, some people, um, usually based upon your, you know, genes, once again, you just can't absorb it regardless. Um, and it made me think too, looking at like these B12 levels, we have it written here. Don't forget the B12 will likely be low in patients on metformin. We've got people on proton pump inhibitors like Prilosec, Nexium, et cetera. Though anything that changes the acid in the, in the gut, certainly we need it sometimes, but if we can avoid it chronically, we like to avoid it because um, it changes the absorption of every single drug that is uh, given you know, in a lower acid environment. Uh, most of it tends to be innocuous, but long term it can affect um, even vitamins, you know, and how we absorb vitamins with those medications. So it gets complicated for sure. Then we have our diabetic neuropathy. Um, you know, this is kind of going hand in hand with uh, what Greg was talking about at the beginning with the diabetic retinopathy and that, you know, capillary disease. Um, patients end up in terrible pain um, and sometimes with amputations long-term. You can also get um, diabetic gastroparesis in the gut. And I mentioned pretty much with hyperlipidemia what I wanted to mention. And that was essentially that, you know, we have our statins, the guidelines have changed a little bit and that's good because now instead of just saying everybody, you know, needs to get their LDL at this specific number, we're looking at patients individually and saying some people need what we now call a high potency dose of statins. So if you've noticed a trend, have you noticed in patients that you have a ton of people coming in on receipt? Rosuvastatin now. So Rosuvastatin is Crestor. Uh oh, this thing has a mind of its own. Rosuvastatin is Crestor. Um, the reason that is you, you see less and less simvastatin, you see less and less of the other statins. And that's because of this slide. And then I'll let Greg round up uh, any other comments towards the end. Don't notice here at the bottom right, it says high intensity doses, rosuvastatin, crestor, atorvastatin, lipitor. They are the only two statins that we have in all of our statin land that can actually treat really, really high LDL. They are the most potent agents. Oh, by the way, rosuvastatin crestor actually also is the only statin that is proven to actually kind of um, chew up plaque that's already been laid down before the statin was started. No other statin has been able to prove that it can do that. So again, crestor can actually, I, I remember it as crusty crestor. Crusty crestor gets rid of the crunchies. Um, that's what I always say to my students when I'm teaching them about statins, because it's pretty remarkable. You start a patient on Crestor and it can actually start to chew away plaque that's already been laid down in uh, blood vessels. The other agents under moderate intensity doses um, are listed for you there. And it doesn't mean everybody should be on a high intensity dose. You know, a drug is a drug and these statins can um, have side effects in some people but there's nothing better if you need it. There's nothing better if you need it for sure than a statin. And I think we're getting towards the end here. Anything you want to add, Greg? No, oh, I think you did a, you know, you did a great job there. Is there anything after, uh, you know, this here was just something I just thought it was kind of cute. You know, patient is taking a new medication for memory loss, but they can't remember what, uh, what it's called. I thought, you know, why did my technician put that in there? But I thought it was just kind of cute. We were talking about, 
um, you know, this, the, the statins and the different medications uh, that are out there. Do you want to talk about any of these other things that you have in here? Niacin? The, I, you know, the main thing was just to remind you, you know, we have other agents, we have niacin, niacin is a B vitamin. So everybody has always assumed that, oh, if I'm going to take a drug for my cholesterol, I'm going to take niacin. And now we actually have a prescription version of niacin called niacin. Um, niacin is, you know, can be a toxic drug just because of the, the, the dose we have to take in order to actually, uh, budge cholesterol. So I'm always going to go to the herb or the supplement, um, you know, for the, if I can, but niacin is an exception. If I had high cholesterol, I would not take niacin. If I had the choice to take a statin because it's really tough on the liver, it, um, can cause stomach issues, it can cause hyperuricemia, et cetera. Uh, once again, just to, I don't get paid by any statin manufacturers. I probably should for as much as I, I boast about them, but there really is nothing better. We do have, um, you know, some people that end up with those high triglyceride levels, which, oh, by the way, goes hand in hand with some metabolic dysfunction as well. Um, you see Tricor and Trilipics. I like the brand names because they're specific for triglycerides. These drugs do nothing to increase good cholesterol. They do nothing to decrease bad cholesterol. They're triglycerides only. We will only use them if we don't get the triglycerides down enough with the statins. And then lastly, our fish oil. I'm a huge fish oil fan. We have some prescription products. Not all of them are created equal. Um, this is a whole different lecture in and of itself. But if you had to, to, to just pick one, you know, tonight, uh, I'm going to take fish oil because it's got so many benefits. Really the um, most common one that is used that's the best absorbed is this triglyceride form. And most bottles will tell you if it's a triglyceride form or an ethyl ester form. And then my very um, last thing here is our cholesterol absorption inhibitor, azetamibe, Zetia. We don't use that quite as much as when it first came out, but this is a drug that sometimes gets added to a statin. So in the end, statin, statin, statin. And, you know, we'll just add one of these other drugs if need be. So, yeah, to, you know, the comment, Tracy, you know, there was a couple of comments that came in about, you know, uh, you know, Alzheimer's and dementia, and, it, and it's all super connected out there. It's not as simple Absolutely. as we can put things into, you know, into pillars. It's kind of more of a, you know, a whole um, kind of team effort. And one of the things I was listening to the other day is that, you know, HDL and LDL, once you know, let, we do a lot of lutein, zeaxanthin, maybe mesozeaxanthin as the carotenoids that we work with macular degeneration. But those have also been, you know, being found to be skin protection and also brain protection too. And the other day I was listening, you know, they're fat soluble, so they have to get into the gut and and then have to get through the gut wall because the stomach is a water environment. So they get, there's a lot of things that happen, but then once they get into the bloodstream, they get carried around with the HDLs and LDLs. And then that's the connection out there to help everyone out is that all of a sudden now, if you're getting rid of the HDLs and, and the LDLs through statins, now you've lost your transport mechanism. So that's why it's all kind of connected together that's out there. So you know, just to kind of, you know, move more food for thought. And, uh, you know, Tracy and I are putting together a kind of a functional talk. Maybe we'll throw that on the list here towards the end of the year. So, but, uh, you, you know, you, just some more food for thought that's out there. So let me see here. Do you want to hit any um, of these? Uh, no, I'll get the questions instead. There's not a lot. Uh, we're running short on time and there's a couple of good questions in here. One of them, is there a role in all of this in protecting against cardiovascular disease using coenzyme Q, uh, CoQ10? I love CoQ10. I love turmeric or curcumin is the one I like. Um, you know, the Co CoQ10 sometimes is used with statins um, to help with the myopathy or, you know, the muscle aches and pains. But um, I do, I personally think that there is a cardiovascular benefit to CoQ10, you know, outside of anything it might help with the statin. So the one thing you don't want to do is just go out and, you know, start taking 10 or 12 different supplements, um, you know, do some research and, um, you know, see what might be good for you. But I do CoQ10, I do curcumin, I do a resolvent fish oil, and um, you know there's good data to support those for sure. Yeah, well, some of the nutritional people I've been talking to is you know we kind of try and target this monotherapy. All I take is vitamin C. Well, then it throws off like all the other vitamins A, you know B, C, D, E, K, you know, and all that. 
you know, kind of go to that monotherapy, so on and so forth. And that's the whole idea is where this is all kind of going down to kind of a, a good supplement that covers everything uh, in, in, a, in a very deep, um, you know, in a, in, rather than kind of a monotherapy, all I take is D and all I take is B and all I take is this. It's probably be more, I kind of use the analogy as, you know, I, I have a football team here and, 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 the, and the quarterback is important. So I got 11 quarterbacks and I really didn't win the Super Bowl, right? Well, you kind of need, you know, a lineman, you need a tackle, you need, you know, you need all these players to kind of work together. And I think that's what you'll see is when you come into this nutrition and prevention is, yeah, CoQ10 is important, but it also needs some other players, kind of like right. lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin. You kind of need all three of them to kind of work together. So, you know, stay tuned with all of that. And so the poll was shared, you know, has this help with the patients with metformin? And I'm glad 100% of the people said yes. So that's always good. That's why we do these. So thank you everyone for attending. Yeah, thank you and, so much. And that was the only time we've ever had any poll at 100%. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's true. So I'm going to put this last slide up and then we'll do some housekeeping. So I want to thank everyone for attending you know, metabolic disease for an optometrist. You know, Tracy, it's always great kind of sharing the podium with you. Thank this you. interprofessional type of uh, uh, CE, you know, love lecturing with Joe, but it's also nice to, you know, Joe and I love doing lecturing with, you know, the, with the different professions that are out there because we do all kind of work together at this for, for better patient care. So thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Joe, anything? I thought that was a, a very high level of presentation with a, a lot of great information. And I think that we're, we're lucky to have Tracy uh, quote unquote on our side.